More than $80 trillion is what I will categorize as a physical industry or industrial industry. It's where the economy is actually moving something in the physical world, not in the internet, to generate something. And those industries that carry more than 80% of the world GDP just did not have the digital transformation yet. And that's kind of was the reason we stopped. You're listening to Augmented Ops, where manufacturing meets innovation. We highlight the transformative ideas and technologies shaping the front lines of operations, helping you stay ahead of the curve in the rapidly evolving world of industrial tech. Here's your host, Natan Linder, CEO and co-founder of Tulip, the frontline operations platform. This is a very exciting episode for Augmented Ops this week. We are talking to Leo Suzan, who is the founder of Eclipse Ventures. I met him eight years ago before it was cool to invest in uh, anything industry, 1.0, 4.0, whatever point0 you want, and how he shifted from working for a Fortune 500 contract manufacturers to invest in startups that maybe they can become the next contract manufacturer. Let's go. Leo, hi, how are you? Doing well, good to see you. It is good to see you. It's been a little while. You know, so Eclipse is now how old? Almost eight years. Wow. I remember we were like back probably eight years ago, sitting around uh, somewhere, probably in Owens Hummus or something like that, talking about how venture capitalists don't understand anything about investing in industrial anything. Yeah, probably the people that sit next to us is, uh, thought, who is this people or not? They, they must be not from... Uh, Silicon Valley, if they're talking about manufacturing and industrial. Yeah. Thanks for coming on Augmented. It's great to have you. You know, this podcast is really about what's happening in all things industrial from many perspectives. And I think bringing people who are focused on investing into startup in the space is always uh, very exciting. Uh, we had uh, folks like Dana Grayson before and a lot of perspective, another, you know, early comer in the industry. And now, you know, when I think about Eclipse, I'm thinking about companies like uh, Augury and Instrumental and Bright Machines and a bunch of others. So how do you define what's industrial and fits your portfolio? When we started the firm in kind of mid-2015, the rationale was very uh, fundamental based, although I was not sure that I understand what is a fundamental investments mean back then. Uh, but it was, hey, if you're thinking about the world the GDP, you're talking about about $100 trillion today, give or take. Uh, more than $80 trillion is what I will categorize as a physical industries or industrial industries. And that's things like logistics, manufacturing, uh, it's aviation, it's defense, it's uh, agriculture and mining, it's shipping. It's where the economy is actually moving something in the physical world, not in the internet, to generate something. And those industries that carry more than 80% of the world GDP just did not have the digital transformation yet. And that's kind of was the reason we started the film. I remember you telling me about the genesis of this all, all the way back to Lab 9 at Flextronics. Mm -hmm. Is that where things got shaped up in your brain to think about this space from a perspective of a venture capital? Yeah, absolutely. And um you know, I did not plan to be a venture capital. I didn't go to uh, Stanford Business School or necessarily was an associate in uh, Sequoia, built my way up. It's not something mm. I had the drought. Well, that's good because I hear they're letting people go nowadays. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> no, not a joke. But yeah, uh, yeah when, when I was at Flex and I was in charge of uh, Lab9, that's the digital transformation team at Flex. And Mike, back then the CEO, hired me to come and build that team. Flex serving exactly those industrial industries, right? So they're doing more than a billion dollar in energy and manufacturing in automotive and medical devices and aerospace and defense. And I had the privilege to meet the CEOs and COOs of some of those Fortune 100, and none of them will want to talk about manufacturing uh, and Flex uh, services. All of them will want to talk about technology and how it's changing mm -hmm. their industries. And I had this weird feeling because I lived in the Bay Area. Everyone is telling me software will lead the road and crypto and now Gen AI. And I'm like, yes, but those industries are actually the one that's running the world and they did not have a digital transformation yet. Mm -hmm. 
that dissonance what sparked in my head the reason to start Eclipse. Yeah, and operations manufacturing is so physical and so at times, you know, super detached from all those uh, big words around cloud infrastructure, this and data like that and all those like mega buzzword trends. Do you remember like an industrial aha moment that you're like, oh my God, there's so much value here that you kind of met maybe on the floor in Flex or in one of those interactions? And how did that actually translate, for example, say for the startup you backed? Because I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't ever connect, you know? Yeah, we have so many of those stories. I will give one quickly. Uh, then I would love to talk about the largest companies in the world, because I think for some reason, I feel there is still in people's minds, mainly in the world of VCs, this notion that if it's not purely on the internet, it cannot be big. And then you're literally looking on the data and see that this is just not true. And naturally, Tesla and SpaceX and NVIDIA and Amazon, all companies that are running physical operation and doing yeah. quite well in the public market. But uh, go back to Flex Stories. Actually, it's touching in Tulip also in some way. We ran a lot of front-end line of SMTs to build the PCBAs. And Flex have 150 factories, about 50 of them have those SMT lines. And we never used the data. You had an operator on the line that was tuning the machine kind of based on mm -hmm. what the machine does. And we had this idea of like, hold on, if we can take the data of the SMT, put it in a very, very basic algorithm to find anomaly detection, can we actually improve in 1% the yield of those front-end line? We end up actually improving in 3% and saved Flex close to $100 million in bottom line every year. That will be in a 3% operating profit, um, a lot of money on the top line, about $3 billion. And it was just exciting and it just made in my head clear that the opportunity to leverage technology in an industry like manufacturing didn't even scratch the surface and the impact is remarkable. Yeah, I have sort of an interesting compliment story to share on that. It's just a little anecdote from a conversation with the Fortune 500 CIO, because we were like making fun of this notion of ROI and perceived ROI, because everybody comes in and the ROI is going to be blah, blah, blah. And the vendor says this and, you know, the buyer says whatever. And like, nobody believes anything anyway. <laughs> No, not, not the vendor sharing the ROI and not the CIO receiving the ROI. And what was like really profound, because like the conversation I'm having is not about like, I want to sell them some BI tool or some, I don't know, cloud infrastructure and that kind of thing. It's more like you got to enable operations. And so the guy explains to me, if I can't attach the investment in the system to something that is actually happening in operations that often amounts to like some lean type of net benefit calculation, you know, reduction of waste, uh, increase of throughput, what have you, then IT people can't support OT. <laughs> you can imagine like why we didn't have any collaboration, or not, I mean, let's not be so radical, but like very problematic, say, collaboration be between IT and OT for many decades, because like they're just chasing other things. And to hear that kind of thing from a CIO, it's actually pretty cool. Yeah. that that's the thinking of ROI as they consider investments in systems for operations. No, it's, um, we spend a lot of time on the engagement between IT and OT, information technology and operating technology. Yeah. And we think um, in the world of industrial, it's um, that linkage is so powerful. And historically, essentially it's the last 20 years, all of the tech progress has been done on the IT side. Right. And we think the next 20 years will be mainly on the OT side and then connect between the two and should have a much better overall world GDP growth if that's happened. Yeah, that's actually a good segue for the next thing I wanted to chat about where, you know, we don't have all the data uh, sources to cite, but you know this cold and we'll include stuff in the, in the comments uh, after the episode. So from a very sort of high level overview, I think the general phenomena that there's a complete discrepancy between the amount of uh, venture capital going into traditional IT, B2B type technology landscape, what have you, your marketing stack, HRIS, obviously now Gen AI, whatever, et cetera, cloud versus let's uh, invest into in industrial and or with you know the hardware component, be it sensors or real manufacturing tech or 3D printing technology, whatever that may be. 
what can you share like from your perspective you know running a fund that is so focused on that H- how do you analyze that phenomena what does it look like in numbers and w- why did it actually happen how is it changing so we we started the fam in 2015 and i will tell you we were alone like nobody would wants to hear about uh, those industries and you know we had some big quite it was always clear to us that those industries are huge but we were like hey maybe we are too early in this phenomena we were seeing like from 2015 to 2016 to 2017 like 20 percent 25 percent growth every year investing in industrial because it was other long-term trends that was happening mm-hmm. like education uh, tesla was already doing really well like space spacex was doing well um, a bunch of the semiconductor companies was doing this and Amazon was pushing logistics uh, farther and farther. So it, it started, but it was not, uh, I would say, step change. Mm-hmm. But I think we really were seeing we're going from double digit growth to 150% and then 200% and 300% year over year growth in investments in that space happened in 2020 uh, when COVID hit. Because I think what happened is you had uh, a ripple effect of the world understanding that there is a massive lack of resiliency in our backbone economy. And that's, we shut down factories, we cannot produce cleaning equipments and toilet papers and meat. The supermarket was empty, we couldn't move the products, we couldn't move along the chain. And the government, I think, woke up and say, hold on, we need to make some significant change into the infrastructure that we are living in, and it's going to come with a massive funding in this country, a trillion dollar infrastructure bill in many other countries and a different type of it bills. And from 2020 till today, we're just seeing a hockey stick of investments in the industrial market. Yes, it did help that Tesla arrived to seven, 800 billion. Yes, it's helped that Nvidia crossed the trillion. It's helped that Amazon continue to grow. And you know, Apple is a hardware company and, and a, a lot of those companies that you know, being a marquee is but we usually don't stop and think about Apple as a hardware company, right? We think about it as a consumer company and it's like, no, no, it's a manufacturing company. And Tesla, it's a manufacturing company and SpaceX, it's a manufacturing company. And I think what the success of those companies with the geopolitics issue, with the global warming, with the COVID bump, with the war in Ukraine is pushing a massive amount of funding that I think will power the next industrial revolution. So th- this is fascinating and like we're, we're going to try and share some numbers like we said before. And, you know, the other thing I see in the numbers often, which I think is pretty accessible, is that it's also about, you know, in what we call frontline operations, about 20% of the global workforce, which is like an insane number, right? Like if you compare it to, you know, the amount of workforce in commercial, so, you know, marketing and sales, business development, stuff like that, which is like somewhere between three to four or five percent tops, depending on how you count. It's orders of magnitude, right? And so the impact is not just on the, you know, dollars spent into the infrastructure. It's actually impacting a ton of people globally across regions, countries, cultures. And how much capital is being invested into marketing people versus frontline? Right. Uh, Historically, from the venture community and the tech companies, I I had a question for you. Slightly different questions, but also on the frontline walkers. But I will let, I will let you finish the thoughts before I ask the question. I mean, the thought is that you know we often think about the digital transformation and the initiatives and like the big bills and all that kind of stuff. And the output is on you know society level, infrastructure, companies, and all that kind of stuff. But there's just like a ton of people involved. That's I guess the point that I was trying to make, and give it a little bit of a context with a number. No, absolutely. We've been asking ourselves that questions and also been asked that questions many times. How you view the frontline workers influenced by technology? As you know, we do a ton in the world of automation and people are always coming and say, oh my God, it's going to replace all of these jobs. And I'm like, guess what? No people that wants to do those jobs. And I think what we want to see is technology like Tulip coming and actually boost productivity so a human yeah. can do much more than he could see before that he can do before but yeah. i'm curious what do you think about automation versus humans and how technology is in yeah so the quick high level answer that of course has a lot of layers into it is uh, what we characterize as the shift from pure automation in the classic sense to augmentation and augmentation can have it in the individual level so imagine 
you know, take a couple examples, like someone who grew in manufacturing, maybe they have just vocational education uh, or just finished high school and, you know, went into manufacturing and grew with the company and now they gain responsibility and they understand the process because they learned it on the job, you know, and they're valuable for the company, but, uh, you know, they're still using kind of sticks and stones as knowledge workers uh, would look into it and say, like, how are you doing your job? with the spreadsheets and the clipboards and whiteboards and whatnot. And on the individual level, that augmentation is that if you think about that same person, they probably have a pretty good command of consumer internet. They drive a you know, thousand bucks smartphone in their pocket and they can be dangerous. They can do many, many things that uh, you consider pretty high tech, but they go to work and there's like, that's in the locker, which is just nuts, right? So that that's an augmentation that is focused on humans, puts the human in the center. But you can extrapolate that. You can sort of think about it at the scope of an organization because if you have many people like that and they have the right platforms, then what happens? You know, that's a sort of a bottom-up yet under governance type of digital transformation that is augmenting an organization or in plain English, it's just change how companies work. This is what Tulip does. This, you know, we are also a part of that. But I would say that this is what companies are looking for. And it's mostly not for the love of digital transformation. It's mostly like to stay competitive because they're, whatever it is, they're trying to ramp up a production line. They're trying to get rid of, you know, issues in their supply chain. They're trying to penetrate new market, whatever it is that is driving that, you know, we're certainly seeing it happening. And that's what I'd say puts the human in the center. I have another point that is related that maybe we can push to you because like my answer to your question was like shift from uh, classic automation to augmentation. And, you know, in the classic automation sense, you know, if you think about Bright Machine, for example, you know, that build those uh, awesome production cells that package a lot of intelligence and, and automation and provide flexibility and all the good things that it does, it, it does still require humans to operate around it. And it's not just like, turn it on and like, make me the whatever thing you want me to make, right? Wow. How do you see this augment, like if we think about augmentation as a trend, how do you see that play into classic automation? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. And as you mentioned, Bright Machines, it's a company that we built to focusing on the back end of uh, manufacturing, basically where you do the assembly and sub-assembly. And, you know, a couple of the stats that I always uh, love to mention because I think they're crazy. Uh, 98% of the electronics in the world is being built by hand. Mm-hmm. Our friends yeah. are being built by hand. That will be yeah. bonkers to think about. And our goal is Bright Machine is to move it to use uh, software defined automation. I love the word actually augmentation. I'm, I might steal it from you uh, when I'm talking about uh, bright machines because the reality, even when we operate uh, with bright machines, there is things that actually the humans are really good and there is things that the robots are really good. Cabling to actually assemble this thing, it just not makes sense. I would yeah. not be able to the UPH, the unit per hours and the first part seal, then the OEE that I need in order to be able to meet the SLA if I'm going to try to put a cable. And this is where inside the line we will put a human stations that will do what human is really good yep. and will work shoulder to shoulders with the robots that will do what robots are really good. Yeah, you just uh, stepped into my trap, as they say. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So bundled in what you just described, there is this mystical term called system integration. Because one, just not have the human next to the machines and magically everything just works with the human brain and whatever the machines are doing. One needs integration. And the so-called trap, it's not really a trap, is, um, you know, I think it doesn't work without an ecosystem. You know, that how do you actually do that on time, on money, given that, you know, we're making new types of automation and making new types of human augmenting technologies, like, you know, say like Tulip or others. What makes this new type of ecosystem work? Because if we're doing it in the way the classical automation players and the classical uh, SI delivery, we're just converging to what costs, uh, I don't know, I saw numbers between, you know, 150 and $200 billion spent annually just on system integration in the US. These these are like very oldish IDC numbers I saw at some point, but it's like, to me, it's like insane amount of inefficiency. Who bears that? Well, manufacturers bear that and then the customers bear, right? I think ecosystem is not an easy thing. 
Mm -hmm. That's my brutal, honest point of view on that. I think, you know, it's really hard to connect between different companies that focusing on a different aspects of the chain and magically everything works like a charm. And I think this is the reason that system integrators is being around for that long yeah. uh, is because they're putting the glue between the pieces. I yeah. think I'm seeing uh, software will eat, I think, big portion of that system integration. And I think you will be able to simplify a lot of things with software. I'm a... Uh, obsessive around vertically integrated. I think uh, a lot of the reason that Tesla and SpaceX is being very successful is because they are vertically integrated. And not only that, they are trying to see where they are not vertically integrated and they were trying to do it as well. <laughs> they have a deep pockets in order to do it. But uh, it goes back to the Bright Machine things. Yeah, we decided that we will do also that portion on the behalf of our customers to just make sure that we are getting our software defined automation on the floor as fast as we can to meet those SLAs. And that's meant for us to do some system integration along the way to help the customers to give us those very loud deals. But uh, I know it's a, it's a fairly controversial point. And I think uh, historically, you needed to mature the ecosystem in order to really transform an industry. And I think it will happen also here in the manufacturing space. Yeah. So I appreciate the brutal, realistic, yet somewhat I'd say not completely pessimistic point of view, mm -hmm. but hey, the internet works, no? Yeah. So what's the problem? What's wrong with yeah. open standards and APIs and all that good stuff that makes the internet run? Yeah, no, I, I found that uh, there is a huge difference between bits and bits mm -hmm. to atoms. When you start touching the atoms, what necessarily works in the bits world, not meaning is fully transferable to the atoms world, meaning Yes, that methodology works amazing uh, in the world of internet. Uh, but when you start touching physical stuff, conveyors and materials and inventories mm -hmm. and factoring lines and finished goods and packaging, it's way, way, way more complicated than just integrated bits when you're sitting in your couch. The price will be bigger. So I'm like, I, I, I sign up my life uh, to solve it because I think uh, I'm, we are seeing what Tesla did it, and SpaceX did it, and few companies did it, and you see the price on the other side. Totally. But I also see other phenomena, you know, companies like Snowflake suddenly appearing in Hanover Messe, and you think about Snowflake, what are they doing there in uh, manufacturing premier trade show? You know, it turns out, well, everybody needs their infrastructure and stuff like that. You can argue that. But, uh, you know, mature products like that find their way into the way manufacturing tech is being shaped and built today because that's how we build technology. And I think it lends itself to more internet-driven system integration that we'll see. That's my personal prediction. And obviously, you know, with my tool path on, we're seeing a lot of this stuff happening already, the way folks are designing, you know, open architectures that they can, you know, mix and match components and things like that. Yeah. and. They're still doing vertical integration to a sort, but like mostly they're trying to take control over their stack and how it evolves, you know, much like we do in any classic IT type of environment. I think the reason that Snowflakes was there is because at the previous point that OT and IT is getting much closer to each other. Right. When that's happening, you have to start having data lakes in the world of manufacturing because I'm now start gathering all of my operation data into a central nerve. And actually, this is the Snowflake uh, uh, naturally business and my guess their business is growing fast in that category because everything we talked about and the reason actually when you're putting bright machine in line uh, you're now talking beats right those robots have a control system so actually it's easier to treat it like a software than maybe a traditional way of assembly i just yep. still feel there is a way to go that uh you are fighting with physics. You still need something on the lines to actually put the product together. And when you are touching physics on the manufacturing, the narrative of a pure software and kind of the pure software methodologies needs to adjust in the world of manufacturing, not only manufacturing, yeah. in general, anything. So we can definitely agree the future will be complex and exciting. Yeah, 100%. And the last thing is, is not only complex and exciting, is... I do not believe the world will grow from 100 trillion to 150 trillion in GDP without digitizing those industries. And by the way, I, will not be I do not believe we can slow down carbon emission 
without digitizing those industries that are the heavy emissions by technology. And I don't believe that you will be able to employ 10 billion people without training them to be part of these modern industries again. So this is not a nice to have. This is a must to have if he wants to stay on this globe for a couple of more hundreds of years. Perfect. You almost anticipated my last question, answered it correctly, and rose to the challenge of summarizing what's next in industrial software space as a VC without saying ChatGPT even once. So congratulations. You're a winner. Thank you. Please send me the trophy. It's uh, being 3D printed as we speak. Right now, by your other company. Yeah, by Formlabs, of course. Thanks so much for coming on the show. This was, this was awesome. Truly appreciate it. Nathan, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Augmented Ops Podcast from Tulip Interfaces. We hope you found this week's episode informative and inspiring. You can find the show on LinkedIn and YouTube or at tulip.co slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time.